absolutely delighted though to have you in. I've been saying on Twitter this week that every time we've got together to discuss the session, I've become more and more enthusiastic about doing it. Um, and just been so interested. And we'll return to this shortly, but I think one of the big things for me about tonight is that we've got somebody who is doing work all over the world and only recently doing work in Scotland. There have been bits and pieces, Ewan, and we'll come back and talk about that. But what I would like to do is just give Ewan the opportunity to kick us off just by telling us a bit about what he does, who he is, and a bit about Notosh. And hopefully he's got his own mic working. Yes, I think so. So thank you so much for coming along on a, it's a pretty dreary day, to be honest. Uh, so hopefully a little sunshine at the end of the afternoon for you. And um, when I, I was a teacher in Scotland and did some great work across East Lothian, um, engaging, first of all, looking at how you engage uh, teachers in sharing more with each other um, through these uh, revolutionary technological things of weblogs at the time. Um, we did some incredible work across East Lothian, um, engaging nearly 800 teachers, up from 20 who would share their practice on a regular basis. So massive, um, uh, we saw the benefit of teachers sharing with each other. Um, I was then asking, you, know, can you do that uh, around the country? And that was where I realized the simple answer is no. Um, because I just kept bumping up against, I'm going to say this as I become one, lots of um, grey-haired men in grey suits saying no to stuff. And so I left, I left education and left Scotland and went off to Channel 4 and became a commissioner, a, if you like, an executive producer at Channel 4. And when I was there learning how people do creative stuff, what was different from the world of education I'd just left um, was that everyone in that creative industry could talk about their work they could talk about how they did it, about their process, about um, how to make a great film, how to make a great TV series, how to do a great thing online or a mobile app. They all talked the same way about what they were doing and no one, no one in education had, in 2008, if you like, been able to do that. Um, no one that I'd met anyway. So that's what led to the birth of No Tosh. It was to cut through the tosh of education and, and the jargon that was getting in the way of people actually talking in simple terms about the stuff that really matters, that really works. Um, it started off with that kind of naive mission and um, 12 years on, we now work with um, about 900 schools in 72 countries um, with organizations like gov governmental organizations with um, some royal families and sheikhs and the whole gamut basically of people trying to do good things in education all around the world. And we um, help them a lot with strategy, so working out what they want and how to make that happen. Um, with leadership, so how do you get particularly middle leaders um, empowered and giving them enough time to actually do good work and leading small teams to make amazing things happen. We do um, a lot on curriculum design, particularly schools who want to create their own curricula. So actually designing their own curriculum from scratch. Um, or building on something like the International Baccalaureate or you know, make, making decisions sometimes to have two different curricula in their school. So really um, working with loads of different curricula around the world, lots of different cultures, contexts, challenges, and um, of course plenty of opportunities to see amazing impact for lots of little people. And the follow-up to that, before we start on the, the four capacities report, which is the other kind of lurking reason for having you here, um, tell us the, some of the stories behind that. You know, that, that's been very much a, an overview and a really helpful overview of what you do. Mm. But I, I found that when I spoke to you, it came alive when you talked about the stories and mm. told the stories of what you did. Is it kind of depends... Kind of depends what interests you as well, because we, we work with schools often, when the school gets in touch, they don't know what they want. Um, they, they say, we'd like to do something. And it might be around cu curriculum, or it might be around, um, you know, our, our students just aren't very motivated. There's a, an amazing school, I think, that we're working with at the moment. The results are incredible. But the, the process of learning is really boring. It's stultifyingly so, and the students are saying that as much. So there you've got a challenge of how do we keep that incredibly high achievement 
but make the learning experience much more engaging and not have a wobble, obviously, because that's you, no one wants the wobble. So some of the most, I mean, the, the, the most fun project, I think, over the years, I actually had it on the screen as a bit of a kind of holding screen when I got started. Um, if I can, I'm going to actually go old school and touch the computer to move the slide forward. But this is in um, Nanjing in China. And it's a school that seven years ago, um, we were asked to look at how we could adapt part of the curriculum to have the creative subjects, art, media, uh, design, craft technology, come together under one roof and teach together in interdisciplinary projects. So that was project one. It was about six months long. And then project two, um, we liked what, what, we, what we saw there. Could you help us with a strategy for learning for the whole school? And so we created a new strategy which put student voice and choice at the center of everything they do. So when you talk about having lots of different pathways in life, it's one of the best schools at, at doing that. And then they came back and said, we were thinking of changing the learning environment itself um, in the early years. I'm a secondary school languages teacher, so I wasn't sure how we could help there. But what we did is we said, look, push off the build. They wanted to build pretty quickly. We said, delay it a year. And instead, um, change the way you want to teach now and see how the, the current space breaks under pressure of, of your new approaches to learning and teaching. And then when they did break the space, they were able to see how that room didn't work for them, how that space got in the way, how you know they couldn't get outside without the kids trailing through corridors endlessly. It looked like there was you know, trains of little people all day long instead of learning. And we created a brief for the architect. We called it Dear Architect. It's a, a letter to the architect. And um, in that letter to the architect outlined all the problems that we had and the opportunities we thought they had. And then the architect who won it was our partner architect in Perth, Australia. And we helped them to design this outdoor space and indoor space, which is just phenomenal for learning. Um, and I think it's an example of a school that has the confidence of having a big, beefy vision. And they published it in paper. I always think it's interesting that people write strategy in PDFs or Google Docs or something like that. They get lost in my computer. I've got that seven years on still. And it's a write-up of their dream. This is the dream that we have. It fits in one page. The rest is all pictures. Um, that's the dream we have. We want to see that come true. And it takes a long time. It takes seven, eight, nine years to make it come true. And we're just starting the build, the rebuild of the secondary and middle school part of the, the space, which is as playful as this is, but for big, smelly kids instead. And so I just, that's one of my favorite projects. It's one, there's, uh, there's tons of them like that. And I think all of that, and but please, if anyone wants to come in, either online or, or live, please feel free to do so, and we'll pick up any points or questions that you want to raise as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ewan wants that, because he's obsessed with the idea of listening to people, and he's obsessed with the idea of both teacher and pupil voice. So, as I say, please feel free. But one of the things I'm fascinated by is that you've got this background, you've got this commitment, You've got this real track record, I think, of success, and yet you still got asked to do the review in the four capacities. Um, and, and that's quite a brave decision, I think, in lots of ways, uh, to do that, because you're bringing a very definite kind of experience, yeah. a very definite kind of perspective to do that review. So it'd be interesting, Ewan, for, for you to take us into that review mm -hmm. and maybe see a bit about the methodology and approach and, and maybe some of the main outcomes, if you like, yeah. from that review. I think you have to go back to the brief. You can find the brief online because it was a public tender um, and you can go and see what we were asked to do and then you can see how we totally didn't do it. Um, when the brief came out, it was um, based on good, good stuff. They had feedback from the refreshed curriculum that they had launched just before a pandemic. Rubbish timing for a launch of anything new. Um, but they had uh, undertaken some events that we ran. So we want, that was our first job in Scottish Territory, other than um, a fantastic time with Calderglen High School, who crazy people hired us to do their vision and think about their strategic planning differently. We thought that was a blip, a statistical blip of working in Scotland. But then. They, we were invited by Education Scotland to run events around interdisciplinary learning and learner pathways. And we turned those into listening events to find out 
does this refreshed narrative actually mean anything? I hate the title refreshed narrative. It's terrible branding. It doesn't tell you what's on the tin, you know, what's in the tin. And what we discovered is um, that people wanted more focus on the four capacities because it didn't really, the four capacities did not really feature in conversation about meaningful learning. And that's, that's not a slant, I'm not criticizing people, it's just people don't talk about it much, particularly in secondary. And I thought that was really interesting. And the second thing is that we had undertaken this with a co-design approach where um, when we ran workshops, when we designed what we were doing, we actually asked people what they wanted and then um, didn't just give them what they needed, we also pushed and prod prodded and poked and gave them provocations that they wouldn't have come across normally to push their thinking. And that little balancing act of um, this is professional learning you want and need to, to get better at your job, but actually we're gonna push you and show you what other people are doing was a great balance. But when we saw the brief, um, it was hard to write a response to it because it assumed a couple of things. First of all, it assumes that the OECD is right in everything it says. And the OECD said back in the day that um, there was wide universal acceptance, is the quote, the universal acceptance of the four capacities. I know hand on heart there is not universal acceptance of the four capacities, anecdotally. So that was interesting. I thought, you can't have, it's not, no such thing as universal acceptance. That's religious almost, you know. Um, and we, the four capacities is not a religion, so let's test that. That was my first thing. And the second was that um, I knew from just reading the paper that there was this overwhelming emphasis on successful learners, and then no one could remember the order of the adjectives and nouns for all the others. And I thought, that's problematic. Because, and I heard a government official, very senior government official, in the review of the OECD that they did the, the years during COVID merged into one, but in a summer time, the sun was shining and I was watching it online and this official said, and the, the, the gold standard of Scottish education is still five hires and my heart went into the basement of my home. I thought there's, there's an issue because if it is, then you've not understood the purpose of our curriculum and that's someone who's meant to be leading it. So we wrote our response to the brief with nothing that they asked for much and said you need to do this instead and to their credit they gave it to us uh, and and when we started designing it we changed their ideas even further and um, the thing that was most enjoyable from that brief was don't just speak to teachers and students but speak to people outside on those um, liminal spaces between school and home so community learning, people in the Scouts, Duke of Edinburgh Award type people, because they, they, youth programmes, they see people, they see th the young people in ways we don't. And they see sometimes successes of young people who in school aren't very successful. So we wanted to get with them. And the other thing we did is we said, we're not gonna run tons of events because that's what people do to create froth. Here's a bit of froth, you know, it's, it's a bit of an event and it, it's really nice. But I guarantee the more interesting conversations will happen when the record button stops and we're a bit more sociable and we have deep discussions and in Twitter for weeks and afterwards because people need time to think. So instead of events, we say we really want to interview people. And when we listen to people in our work, we create a strategy for a school or if we are um, thinking about a new way of learning in a school, will always go and listen to mums, dads, carers, aunties and uncles who pick up the kids from school. We listen to the young people themselves um, and the teachers and the staff, the non-teaching staff, the whole gamut. And when we listen, it starts by asking the right question. We never ask people what they want because we can't always promise we'll deliver it. So we don't ask that. It's probably the biggest mistake in the national conversation is asking people what they want. And the other challenge is people don't know what they want because they don't know what they don't know. Mm. So you ask, you planning those questions is really key and we do it every day, so we're really good at it. And then shutting up and actually listening to what people say is the next part. And you can't do that in a large event. You can do it with three or four people in front of you and really, really listening and it's exhausting. So we interviewed 150 people in no, groups of no more than two or three people at a time. Uh, my colleague Athol McLaughlin, who's based in Brussels, helped me with that. Has an insane understanding of Scottish curriculum, more than me, I would say. Um, 
we interviewed in slightly larger groups 600 young people, but we actually did interview them and we used technology to capture their answers and then follow up with some of them afterwards as well. We interviewed some of them in depth just to check our assumptions and a few things. Um, we had all the participants from our ideal work. So and, in the end, it was about 300 adults and 600 kids who we, who we listened to intensely to produce, I don't know what it is, 14 pages of summary of, you know, this is actually the challenge with these. And um, we discovered that the OECD was wrong, not universal acceptance of these capacities. Um, people are not sure they're right. They don't know where they came from. They don't know why it's that particular order of adjectives and nouns. Is it a, you know, is it a, a copy of previous work? If so, who were you basing it off? There's no references provided. No one knows, well, you, actually, we do know who was around the table, but we don't know their methodology for creating them. And if you're a kid, you don't know where they come from, and you don't care. And that was the biggest outcome. Um, kids don't care. They don't know them. They're tokenistic very often, and for the vast majority of young people, they don't even know what they are, if you ask them. So if that's the signifier of our purpose of curriculum, purpose of showing up to school, we've got a bit of an issue. Um, and that's what we try delicately and diplomatically to put forward in this report. <laughs> Read the report and it, um, I won't slander myself, but uh, my view is that um, the purpose of showing up to school, purpose of a curriculum in Scotland is not that clear. And it leads to all sorts of issues like kids not wanting to be there. And <clears throat> we, when we spoke about this, um, one of the things that Ewan and I talked about is a classic quote that I use all the time about purpose not simply being an organisation's reason for being. Mm. Uh, sorry, not, not simply a target that an organisation aims to achieve. It's an organisation's reason for being. And my, my view is that the whole sense of purpose as defined by the four capacities got totally lost because we went for years tokenistically saying, I am fully supportive mm. of the principles of Curriculum for Excellence. And then we got the exams and everybody just kind of went, crap. This is what it really looks like. The, the problem with purpose is that a curriculum can't have purpose. Schools have purpose. Communities have purpose behind them. And every school's purpose is different. Um, the, you know, the, and schools that are, are really close to each other geographically can have completely different points behind them, totally different purposes. And when we did the... Um, we did a great project with Education Scotland again. They've been really generous, I have to say, and, and, and it's been great to be able to do that. Um, and it, good work to do in a lockdown, because all you need to do is listen to folk um, on Zoom. It's quite cathartic. But listening to all these practitioners in really far-flung places in Scotland, it, and it was it just ended up the fact that some of the most interesting examples are literally on the coastal fringes of our country. They're in glens that are really far removed from the city as well as inner city um, schools and nurseries that, that you might not even see are there behind the walls of the houses in front of them. So you massively varied how one country can say, yeah, this is the purpose of our education system. You can come up with something um, political, you know, it's, it's to prepare young people for boom, yeah, yeah. But locally is going to be much more interesting. If I look at, I, had, I can't remember anything, so I have to <laughs> write everything down. This was, I got posted this, um, International School of Zug in Luzerne. Zug, Zug's a place that you go to hide your money in Switzerland. Chancellor, ex-chancellors of the Exchequer may, may or may not have bank accounts there. <laughs> so um, it's a different clientele maybe from some of our young people. But listen to this as a mission, as a purpose of the school. We're a community of learners determined to make the world, or our corner of it, a better, kinder place. We reflect our values in everything we do so that we make the most of opportunities and challenges in a spirit of enthusiastic inquiry. A bit wordy, but it tells you a couple of things. It says, we're not going to make posters about saving the world, but we will do something concrete in our bit of it to try and make the world a better place. Um, we are going to take our values, which are... are, are, are I think they're written in the logo somewhere. Respect, motivate, and achieve. We're going to take those values and make sure it's in everything we do. So they want, needed to give that a bit more oomph. And they want to use inquiry in everything. So whether it's a primary school class doing some uh, interdisciplinary projects or senior high school math class, 
It's still going to be done through inquiry-based learning. It's still going to be more kind of Joe Bowler's lim limitless learning in mathematics than traditional teacher at the front telling you what to do. So as a purpose, it lets a new member of staff understand pretty quickly what the expectation is. That's a different purpose from um, the international school, uh, the American school in Warsaw. They have, uh, this is actually the prototype that we wrote. This is, uh, you may know Jerry Farrell, our creative director from his work uh, in Scottish advertising, global advertising. He's, he's the man behind Iron Brew's Fanny adverts. <laughs> If you'll pardon the expression. It's a classic advertising campaign that some people may know. It sold a lot of Iron Brew. So this is his handwriting. And when we were sat down trying to work out you know, what makes the American School of Warsaw special, we listened to all the community. We had about 5,500 um, stories that, that had been submitted from the community about their school, what makes it special. And we synthesized it down into five things. Um, and this is their values and, and their purpose, you know. We make the whole world your classroom. So when they learn about Auschwitz or Second World War, they don't just read a book, they don't watch a video. They have the Auschwitz survivor visit them and talk to them in Polish. And they have to understand it in Polish. So isn't, I don't care if you're a Scot or an American, better get your Polish scrubbed up because you're in fifth, sixth year at school, you're hosting this Auschwitz survivor. And of course, every year that becomes an even more precious yeah. kind of thing. Step forward and make things happen. Don't wait to be told. You know, this thing of compliant kids. Yeah, they, they're compliant kids in this school. They're generally quite well behaved. They do their work well, but they might not be very entrepreneurial. Um, work together because without us all, we're nothing. So there's no point being the smartest kid in the class if you're not helping the weakest person in the class. Uh, bounce back when things don't go your way. Work out a way to get around it. Failure is great as long as you know what to do with it. Uh, put the same into life as you put into school. So their, their problem was that their kids were kind of really good as long as it was in the test. But if it wasn't in the test, they wouldn't want to do it. So how do you encourage an environment full of music, theatre, drama, sports, if it's not graded? So that, that's served beautifully in the last five, six years again to change the vibe of that school completely. And it's improved their academic outcomes as well. But that's that school. That's its purpose. So I would challenge everyone and say, actually, the curriculum purpose, purpose of Scottish education is found within your walls. Go and listen. Go and find out what makes your community tick. What do they need? And then write your own purpose and whack it, not just on the wall, but whack it into every activity you do in school. And I, I mean, there's so much, I think, in that. And, and again, please, if anyone else wants to come in on this, do so. But one of the things which, which is terrifying around that is the degree of centralization that you're highlighting. Mm. You know, that, that we're a small country and we think we can essentially dictate everything from the center in a way. And the whole idea of Curriculum for Excellence originally was to create a framework within which schools could create curriculum. And what we got arising from that was a demand for greater and greater specification. Mm. So we've now finished up with, I think it's at the last count, 42 million experiences and outcomes, which are so wild and free ranging, they've had to be corralled in a series of folders. Um, and that clearly wasn't sufficient in terms of authoritarianism. So we've now added 4,000 benchmarks to it. Um, you know, so, so we've, we've gone from framework and flexibility to an absolutely rigidly overly structured model. And we're now looking to see if we can agree nationally how we can buttress that. Um, but I, which is an interesting <laughs> parody, obviously, and caricature. But it's an interesting contrast to what you're talking about as a model for development, you. Yeah, I've got nothing wrong with standards. Um, Standards-based curricula work all right, you know, it kind of depends on what you're doing, but um, it made me, you just made me think of another, another school, another environment. So this was one that we opened. This was my lockdown school. So in March, just as, uh, two days before we got, all got thrown into lockdown, we had this um, person get in touch, said we want to start a new school in Romania in the hills of Transylvania. Are you up for it? And I was like, yeah, it's great. And then two days later, they phoned up along with, we lost 85% of our customers in the space of 10 days. So we lost um, all the money that pays for all the staff disappeared. 
And um, it, I think it was a point where I thought we'll be closed by July. So I was kind of que sera, sera um, living, living in my head a little bit. And so this person came back and said, we can't afford, we're going to stop construction. We're not sure what's going on. And I said, look, I'm essentially unemployed. I'll, I'll put some skin in the game, sweat equity. Let's just build a school, be fun, be something to do. And so I needed something to occupy my, my hands and my mind. So we set about designing a school and it's in Transylvania, it's in Romania. We needed to use local teachers rather than expensive international ones like you. Um, we needed to harness what we had locally. And so we did. And then a year later, September 2021, this is opening day. And it's called the Kalina Learning Center. And there's a couple of cool things about it. Um, one is, I mean, first of all, every, you have to be beautiful to work there and go there, I think. Everyone is stunning. We have beautiful photography. But what's incredible about it is it's actually a project to build a village. And this is, this is um, about July 2021. And you can see the village being constructed. You'll see the organic farm. And the school is in the heart of that village. And the school is the reason the village exists. So the kids, um, uh, effectively, at the moment, they have two of these houses knocked together to make the school. So we used what we had. When it came to those local teachers, we said to them, look, your curriculum is sat in the fields all around you. That's your curriculum. That the reason this place live, uh, exists is also really clear. Um, and what we had done was we came up with a promise. So with the founder of the school, um, on the, the website, we actually published this promise. And the, we knew that we wanted to be expeditionary um, in, in approach. We knew that the standards we were going to use were from New York State because they're there and they're as good standards as anyone else and they're free. But our manifesto was this, that adults are the real curriculum. So we wanted to create a school where adults were learning alongside their children um, about different things in a different way but they were able to learn how to thrive in life. And so our purpose in this school is that every child learns to thrive in life. And we came up with 10 promises we we're going to keep ourselves. Um, that it's about fostering each individual's personal vision, that the school is there to learn essential skills to thrive in life, not just to live in your head, but to learn how to, how to really live and, and enjoy things. It's based on mastery, so not moving on to the next thing until you feel solid in what you're doing right here, right now. Um, and that celebrating successes would be a, a hugely important part. It's nice, friendly language for formative assessment, but it, it, that we would continually look for those highlights. Um, and this is what's emerged, is a school where um, curriculum is... Uh, the, 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 the curriculum is almost entirely based out loud. This is the new principal who we managed to tease over from Scott's uh, St. Andrew's College in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, where they play bagpipes and have pipe bands and things in the sun. We managed to get him to come over to the hills. He was one of about 300 people who applied for a job that we didn't have when we put that manifesto up. People just said, we like that, we want to be part of that. And they um, undertake expeditions, which you may have heard of in the Scottish context. There's a couple of great schools doing expeditionary learning here in Scotland. Um, Dice Primary springs to mind, but plenty others. So their expeditions included, um, as the graduation expedition actually, they've got all this beautiful countryside, but no easy way to cycle around it. So they created a cycle route that takes you on, a, um, I think, a 20 kilometer trail all the way around the village and around the hills. Um, they have a, a mushroom expert who's actually the graphic designer of the school uh, that we use, uh, also a mushroom expert, taking them out to understand the forests around them so they don't kill themselves and that they can benefit from what's on their doorstep, picking wild mushrooms, learning how to cook them together. They've got the organic farm on site where they learn how to, you know, the whole life cycle and the water cycle for real. Um, and then building the cycle path, which is a legacy for the whole community. And they're only four or five years old. In 2024, we're opening the middle school and the high school for this as well. It'll be up to full complement. Um, this is the grand opening of the cycle path, as they all, that, that was their graduation day. No hats and throwing things into the air or cake. Instead, they went on a big bike ride around the cycle path that they had created, along with mums and dads and hangers on. So beautiful school, 
really clear purpose and the curriculum is designed entirely um, using New York State standards on the one hand, the idea and structure of expeditions which we gave to the staff and then we gave them two months. We said work it out and we supported them a wee bit but actually smart people given time together can do great things and it's a world beaten curriculum it's being accredited right now which is that's exceptional because NEASC the accreditation board normally take four or five years to accredit they're doing it now a year in I mean there are there are three really interesting areas for me around this I think um, one for me and we, we haven't discussed this in the prep Ewan so for, forewarned is not forearmed in this case. One is the issue of workload. And, you know, we were talking earlier on about this. At the moment, people in Scottish schools are so busy drowning, they've forgotten how to swim a lot of the time. Um, and they don't have time to reach for the lifeboats. Second thing is accountability. And there's been a real reinforced sense, I think, of accountability. And the whole commitment that we've made to raising attainment has been a bit like saying you only need one capacity. Um, you value what you measure. Absolutely. And, and so I think there are significant issues around that whole idea of accountability and how mm -hmm. that works. And the third area is assessment. And we're at the stage in Scotland where we're waiting for the outcomes of Louise Hayward's review mm -hmm. on assessment. But the sense is that a, a new marvellously made the point earlier on that if the higher is still the, the gold standard and five hires is the benchmark, then that doesn't really encourage the kind of experimental developmental curriculum that you're talking about at school yeah. level. Do you, do you want to comment in uh, any or all of these areas? We, put, we were pretty blunt in this, that the, the, the stuff in schools, so the parts of the curriculum that both so here's the other thing, young people and teachers don't differ in their opinion of what matters at all. Um, at all. It's almost like they spend a lot of time together. Um, and that's something I think that policymakers need to maybe remember. The best people for making policy are people who work with young people and young people themselves. If you look at uh, this morning, I will come back to the point. This morning, um, the International School Awards were taking place. And uh, Western Academy Beijing won the Innovation Award for Strategy. Why? Because no adult writes that strategy. It's one of the most elite schools in Asia, one of the most high achieving as well. It's a great, it's really innovative too. So it's not even just, it's not an exam factory. Um, students at the school listen to the community, run focus groups, and they create the strategy for the school with some help. But students do it. Imagine a national policy written by students. And what we do is we hire academics who couldn't be further removed from the classroom to shape policy. I think that's wrong. I think you're much better to um, listen and assist. That would be the best. Listen and assist and let things be a little bit more shaped by the people close to the action. Um, you can listen and then synthesize, which is a lot of what we do, um, trying to capture that voice, but make it palatable and easy to, to actually make happen. But what you can't do is, is kind of um, cook it up. And there's a risk always with when you're, when you're designing curriculum, when you're thinking about purpose, that people think it's cooked up in a room somewhere. So it's really important to be visible about how you are, uh, you have to have an open kitchen. You can't have the door shut for that. Um, when you think about in the report, we talk about all the things that young people and teachers love. It's all the stuff that gets the squeeze when accountability comes in. It's extracurricular. So when you're, when you're short of time, the first thing to go is your lunchtime running club. And then it's going to be, then it's school bands. Um, I have to say, um, it's school bands, and we're in the city of Edinburgh. My daughter is a trombonist with the Edinburgh School's Jazz Orchestra, and they put on the most incredible concerts. There's one coming up in March. If you want to come along, um, she's the good trombonist. Uh, she, they're all great. They're all great, but I'm just proud dad when I see that. But the other orchestras are phenomenal. And a lot of that is down to the instrumental instructors really going above and beyond. It's down to my council tax being spent in the right way, in my view, on something that gives joy not only to the kids, to their families, but to everyone else too. 
it's the first thing that gets the squeeze. Edinburgh kept their music construction the whole way through as other local authorities squeezed it because you need to spend money on literacy and numeracy and all those issues, all those ologies, the things that are going to get the attainment up. When actually, give a kid a trombone, give a kid a violin, their attainment will go up. If you look at um, Inverlochy Primary School up in Fort William, their music instructors went off to America, as you do, to explore band camp, which is an American thing. It's a cultural norm almost. If you've watched a, any 80s film, you know what band camp is. They went away, they were totally inspired. They came back and to their credit, they worked out a way to make it happen because buying all those instruments ain't cheap. Teaching all those kids how to play them ain't cheap, but they did it. Edinburgh kept their music. Loads of other local authorities killed it off. And it was, what, last year that the government finally said, no, it needs to be guaranteed uh, provision for, for musical instruments. So there's, don't worry, it's only one generation, maybe two, maybe three generations of kids who will not benefit from having music instruction. Why? Because we're so focused on helping them count and read. And that's, it's daft to do that. I think we need to have, um, I, think, I think we're doing it the right way. I think we need to have higher expectations of our budgeting people, our politicians, that actually we do want it all and we will have it all. Um, the first thing is, is um, don't get rid of the stuff that matters the most to young people, which is often not the core curriculum. I think the second thing is for teachers to keep really engaging teaching, you have to have time with each other at the same time. N planning alone is horrible. Planning with a buddy can be joyful. If you want interdisciplinary learning, which has been policy for a decade, but not really taken a foothold, the reason for that is there was no money to support the policy. Interdisciplinary learning, by our estimate, costs about 30% more to run than just bog standard teachers teaching their own class in their own box. It costs 30% more because you need to allocate time, not just time not teaching, but you and I need to not be teaching at the same time. And we also need more than 50 minutes at a shot to plan. You kind of need two, three hours to get really stuck into it, at least initially, to create a plan for the, the schedule. So it needs a 30% odd increase. There's a school in New York who I should have been in on a call with, but my colleague is handling, with, handling them now, and they're debating introducing a new curriculum to their school. So to have two curricula in their school, and it's going to be more interdisciplinary. What's great, it's a private school, it's Manhattan. I mean, so we've got budget to play with of some degree. It's really important that we can go to them and say, that costs this much more to do. So if you want to do it, just take the decision and then go find the money. And there you're talking about donations and donors and things like that. With government, you find the money. There's always money. Just allocated in different ways. And I bring you back to my three anchors, if you like, yeah. in terms of workload, accountability, and assessment. And, and just see if you, you do have any thoughts on that. Although the yeah. ones you had were really interesting. Too. Yeah. I think work, workload's uh, huge. Um, I know just personally, my wife uh, apparently is part-time. I've never seen her not work six days a week. She, she teaches for uh, three, and she prepares Monday and Tuesday. She works the same rhythm as I do during the day, so long days. If she were teaching five days a week, I don't think she would want to be a teacher anymore because she wouldn't be able to do it well. And I think everyone wants to, want, wants to do their job well, but that means you've got to have time to think about it. Otherwise, you end up with that kind of um, harebrained, um, just lolling from one lesson to the next. And I've done that plenty of times. It's not ideal. So I think um, that comes back to my 30% more question. You need more teachers to be able to teach the ones that are there to free up time for those teachers to plan and kind of go in a merry-go-round of, you need to think differently about timetabling as well to do that. Um, I think that having kids ramming through 50-minute chunks in a day is it's so much mental switch. There's no wonder that there's behavior challenges. Of I would be badly behaved if you made me kind of get geared up for something and then say, right, stop getting geared up for that now. You're going to go off to this one. So I know that longer time blocks terrify some teachers, but actually two and a half hours really digging deep into something is totally, it's a totally different way of being, a totally different way of learning than ramming your way through the curriculum 
50 minutes at a time or an hour at a time. And the other thing is that without that switching, you also decrease the workload for the teacher, not increase it, because yeah. you're able to plan much more fluidly into one block, and then you've got a bigger gap between learning moments to be able to reflect on, right, did we actually achieve, you can do more formative assessment in class, did we actually achieve what we set out to today? What do I need to do next? What do you need to do next? Great, see you Thursday. Whereas when it's 50 minute chunks, it still takes 15 minutes to do that end of you know, reflection, maybe some formative assessment. It, it takes the same amount of time, but it's, a, it's now 20% of my lesson rather than 3% of my lesson. So that's a, workload is not just down to teachers also looking at ways that each person can be more efficient. Yeah. It's also got to look at the system of time in the school so that people can take a little bit more ownership of their time. If you push people into cells and bells, they will act like prisoners. Give people longer stretches of time, then they can be much more creative with it and much more efficient. And, uh, and one of the things just to, to throw into that is that, you know, phrase I use a lot is the idea of good tired and bad tired. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done work and it's been really successful. And at the end of it, I'm knackered, but I feel great. It's when I'm frustrated. It's when I'm making the effort and I feel I'm treading water or going yeah. backwards. Then I get bad tired. And that's the corrosive tiredness that burns people out mm -hmm. and takes them out of the profession, exactly as you say. So your idea that people have purpose that yeah. relates to the context that they work in and have a sense of value in their work, I think is a hugely liberating and energizing factor. And I think you're right to, mm. to identify that. Nice example in XP school down in the northeast of England where they put very simply, it's another expeditionary learning school, interestingly as well. That, that's just by accident, not by design. But their uh, purpose is for, one of their purposes is for young people to make beautiful work. Ron Berger, um, the who runs a lot of expeditionary learning in the United States, talks about the importance of young people making beautiful work. It's not, not just going through the motions, but actually making beautiful work. That's a great purpose. So even if you're having to teach algebra that day, which can seem like a dry thing, if you're a mathematician teaching how, you know, the beauty of equations is fantastic. And if you've ever had a math teacher show you the beauty of equations, it's a brilliant way to learn algebra. I'm going to guess from the tumbleweed that no one's had that yet. Um, probably not enough time. Probably the bell is about to go. So, yeah, individual purpose is important too. And you need to know what, you're, what are you trying to achieve with young people. As a language teacher, for me, it was always, number one, they love coming in to the classroom. They feel that they're in a wee microcosm of La Belle France or um, Deutschland. It was, you know, and that, so I had coffee machine on for me most of the time, but just the smell. I, had, um, I did breakfasts when it took my fancy. didn't advertise that we were going to have breakfast. It just appeared from uh, Tesco. Got Tesco to give me free croissant for the purpose. Uh, a bit of promotion in the school, you know, and th that kind of stuff. So number one, that, I didn't care actually if they were learning. Number two, you don't speak any English in my class. What's the point? We're going we're gonna to speak French. We're gonna... Unfortunately, I was the world's worst German teacher, but we're going to speak German, we're going to try to speak German, but we're going to speak French all the time. And if you want to speak English, there's a hula hoop on the floor and you have to get up and stand in it. And most kids, pretty lazy, don't want to do that. So they speak the language. I loved it and they did really well. And a lot of those students are still, they still get in touch on Instagram now trying to speak French, but they had fun. Yeah, and, and I think there's a real power around that. And I mean, one of the things that I, I want to go back to, and we'll keep the flow of this going. Sorry, do you want to come in now? Yeah. Hold on. Oh. I'll bring you a microphone. A roving mic. Hi, hi Ian. Thanks very much for your talking. I'm, I'm Damien Hayes. I'm at Birmingham High School. Um, I want to push you a little bit, because uh, um, I read your stuff, and then we had a discussion at school with teachers about it, and then we had a discussion with the pupil voice group. So it was about 30 or 40 kids, and we sat and talked around what you'd written, particularly the kind of keep, kill, or cure for the yeah. four capacities at the end, which I thought was a really good framing for it. And you know, with, with a lot of stuff being quite busy in people's heads, that cut through, and people could understand. So. Um, the students in my school were pretty much, as you described, they'd either not heard of the four capacities or didn't care that much. Maybe they'd done it at primary school. 
If you asked generally students and staff what the purpose of the curriculum in Scotland was, um, they all more or less did subscribe to all four of the four capacities. They thought that they were good things in being, you know, proper confident individuals and all, all the various bits and pieces, which I can never remember all four, which I think is a bad sign. Um, but they also all said that there's a purpose to get out of school and get a job at the other end. And that things like the hard bits of qualifications, the kind of difficult, boring, often exams, the grind at that end, was also totally essential. And so the pushing bit, maybe, is how do we get those two opposing things? I think they're in opposition often, actually. Mm. Um, I, I, can, I can see a bit, you know, your Beijing school with amazing teachers, all carefully chosen, infinite money and all of that, maybe, can, can merge the two. But I think there's, they're, they're often in opposition. They feel like they're in opposition in my daily life, you know, the creativity. So the I, question is, yeah. how do you merge that, that, that aim to get uh, qualifications or get into university or whatever it is you need, the end point from school, yeah. with all the creativity, the wider person, all of that sort of stuff? I, so I agree that there's a tension. I think you're spot on that there's a tension. The, the, what school's for? I thought it was really interesting that they, they were largely aligned. It's to um, Examinations were pretty low on the list. It was more... Um, actually to learn stuff. It's enjoyable to learn new stuff. And young people said that as much as teachers. Um, to learn how to live, how to, how to thrive and, or survive. Or, you know, but it was some intention around getting, getting yourself sorted out for life. Um, very few thought of it as a stepping stone. And that's important to say. No one sort of said it's just a stepping stone on the way to university or on the way to job. They didn't see it as preparation for the future. They were, young people see school very much as a here and now. They don't see it as a preparation thing for some life later on, um, which is normal, I think. A large part of the sharp end, the successful learning stuff, is really just the last year or two of school. And when we were talking with young people, even down in, into the primary school, we've, we got a, a gut feel, not a scientific feel, but a gut feel, that the influence of what happens in fifth and sixth year goes down to probably primary six for, for some young people and their parents especially. And that's not particularly useful. So a couple of things. Um, one is you've got to resist the temptation to get too narrow too early um, and keep the opportunities going. I think it's interesting, Luke, I'll, I'm fairly honest about it. The, one of the, the, most of our clients, most of our schools are private. They're international schools. And um, yes, they have more money. They have more disposable cash than a state school. But 85% of their salary, 85% of their budget is still salaries. And those teachers are still as wavy a uh, scale of quality as your school, as any school. There is always an average, by definition. There's always a teacher who's struggling, and there's always one who's acing it, and there's everyone in between. So I wouldn't... The, I, I don't think that the comparison is too far off. The thing with the, the difference being that maybe they've got more disposable cash. What they do with that disposable cash, though, is normally building buildings, actually. It's big capital projects. One of the reasons that people send their child to these international or independent schools is because they offer opportunities. Very often, the number one reason parents choose it, for the opportunities it will offer my, young, my kid. And they're not talking about exams. They're talking about all the non-examinable stuff, the experiences, the people they'll meet, the opportunities to get out of school and go on trips and do things. That's what they're going to that school for. And if you look at Singapore American School, there's a school with four and a half thousand students. And when we went to work with them, my view, my perception was that when you get to the final couple of years of school, diploma program, um, a bit like doing your advanced hires, that it must feel like a different school at those years. And when we arrived, our brief in Singapore American School was, we want to create a curriculum for them, a, a course that they can take, that they opt into, that is as playful feeling as middle school, but is intellectually more demanding than the maths they're doing and the English language and all the rest. So we created the Catalyst program, which is where they have to develop their own project they have to find an expert outside school who can help them make it happen and then go through a design cycle to actually bring the project to fruition. And to give you an example, uh, one kid wanted to learn how to brew beer. 
um, and do it properly at scale and did. The, another one wanted to put a satellite into space in order to track um, uh, global warming changes and he did. His satellite is up there now, got it in the commercial satellite in space. That was their catalyst project. If you're wanting to study astrophysics or if you're wanting to uh, do anything in that domain, your examination results are going to get you so far, but actually the story that you told about getting your satellite up in space is probably going to win it for you. So it's so important to keep these opportunities in if you can. I think look at the hurdles, what gets in the way of those extracurricular opportunities. Uh, money for the kids who can't afford it. So we need to find ways that we can fund kids and not make money a reason that you can't take part in an activity. Transport is often a massive challenge. I only got my driving license last September. I've just discovered the world of the world <laughs> that's there. But when I was asked, you know, we did a project in St. Andrew's Roman Catholic High School in the East End of Glasgow. You try doing that without a driving license. It takes three and a half hours from here to do that. So transport's hard uh, for a lot. In that case, you know, can we pay the bus pass? Well, you don't need to now. That's one less thing to worry about. Is it about timings and pickups and things like that? Can we sort that out? So often it's the tiniest things can get in the way of young people being able to participate. And then I think it's just about looking at where the needs are and asking people what kind of thing you want to do. I love what Calder Glenn did. They took their craft design technology engineering, electrical engineering project that normally takes a whole term to do uh, because of the chop change and the, the switching that goes on. And they said, what we'll do is take a day out of school. We'll go to a local engineering firm, a proper factory with smells and noises and white coats and things, and we'll do the whole project in a day. So instead of, what, 12 hours of course time, they did it in six hours on, a, on one day. Plus they got to wear white coats and kind of be with real engineers. And the context there made it feel like extracurricular work, even though it was hardcore curriculum, you know. So that kind of thing can, can achieve the same purpose. I, I think it's interesting. A, a lot of this, I think, is, is about courage. And I think what you're talking about a lot of the time in No Tosh is creating the possibility and potential for courage. And we do not assess in a way that, re that rewards good practice. What we do through the SQA is avoid ambush. And the mantra is that no child should be disadvantaged by the way in which they've been prepared for the exams. And we had the opportunity, we did it years ago in standard grade development. We put out trial exams which assessed in a different way. We let people see how children would be assessed before we built it into the formal examination. And that avoided the nature of ambush, but actually opened up the possibility of assessing much more creatively. We've got a review of assessment. We're supposed to have the reform of the SQA, whatever the flip happened to that. Um, you know, we, we've been promised so many reviews which are all gonna land sometime in March. And the fear is that we'll fail in terms of taking the opportunities that are open to us. And that was one of the questions, if I may, Ewan, that I was gonna come back to, was I think what we've been very good at in Scottish education for years is missing opportunities. That we opened up possibilities with Curriculum for Excellence, we closed them down. Um, and we've recently opened up the national conversation and, and I, I want to take us into that just a wee bit. Um, I was at the HDS conference, the Association of Heads and Deputies Scotland, and they had a full half day workshop on the national conversation. And most of the people couldn't get into it because the questions were too big, too vague, too aspirational, and too unstructured. And it just became an exercise in indulgence, fantasy, and disengagement. Um, and I think the worry is that we have no idea now what's going to come back, because that discussion's been so open, um, and I loved it. Uh, Shirley Ann Somerville, um, at one point, saying what a great time she had speaking to kids. Well, of course she did. It's great speaking to kids. But if you really think you're going to find the right answers to the structure of assessment by having a conversation with a group of seven-year-olds, good luck to you. Yeah. Um, but we've set all of these interesting here's running. 
And my question is, do you think, do you think we've gone about it the right way? Do you think we can now corral these hares mm. and get them into some kind of, you know, message that we can usefully take yeah. forward? Or I mean, is this another false dawn? It will, it will go down like a fat in an elevator with some folk when I say this, but from a professional stance, because this is all we do. All we do is listen to communities and develop, well, strategy or policy, and we, we, you know, we do it in all these countries around the world who trust us to get on with it. Um, we wouldn't have done it this way. Um, the, one of the challenges is the idea of reform. Reform tends to work with events, big events. It tends to work with uh, conversations, and it tends to be political. Political's up, up there, that kind of policy thing. Whereas it's probably what we need, I think what people want is more like a revision, like a revising. And when you revise, you're, oh, it's ongoing, first of all. It's listening, it's synthesizing what you've heard and then making an edit and then going back to the people and saying, is that what you meant? So it's, it's a very slow process. It's a, maybe like watching paint dry, but actually, that's, if you want success, you have to go that way. And it's hard work and it costs quite a lot of money because you've got to hire people who know how to do it. And, and so, First thing is listening depth matters more than sheer numbers. So you could interview 10 kids. I bet if we went and interviewed 10 of your students, and we interviewed uh, 10 from, I'm look, trying to work out who looks like a classroom teacher, so please don't be offended, but 10 of your kids, I'm guessing, are you a teacher? No. <laughs> Who's a teacher over here? But no Thank one. you. So I'm assuming you're not at Muir, different school. Okay, so interesting. So what's interesting as well is knowing the area. So guaranteed that if we speak to 10 of your students, 10 of yours, they will say slightly different things, but when you synthesize it and you dig deeper and ask you, where does that come from? You'll find that there's actually a red line that runs through it all, and you can come to some conclusions. You can then go out large, like the, the national conversation is done, and you can, you can validate with effectively surveys. So you say, our hunch is this, because we spoke to 10 people. Let's test that hunch. And if it comes out wrong, you go and speak to maybe 20 more to work it out. Um, the skill in synthesis is something which, when we are hired to do this kind of work, we have to explain in massive detail how we are going to synthesize all those voices. And we, we are called over the, in a nice way, hauled over the coals by the school board, by, I mean, I, I, I have to do this in front of boards with 12 men, all called His Excellency in front of me. You have to be able to explain your process before you go about doing any of this work. And if you can't do it, you won't get hired. So it has to be transparent and visible. This is how we're going to use your voices. And by the way, we've also got this research body, this research body we're going to do, which is why we always publish our sources at the end of any, any of the reports that we write. You've got a, a whole NSC waiting for you. And then when you've done that, you have to come up with ideas. You can't just present the synthesis, which is a traditional management consultant thing, is you just present the synthesis. These are the conclusions. And you might try to give some recommendations. You really need people to come up with ideas. And that's where you bring together your um, kind of talent. You find your talent around the country, people who are up for it, who've shown, you know, they've, they've tried to make some of these changes happen already with some success. And then you say, right, how do we make that happen at scale? What, what would the needs be? And you draw up a spreadsheet with the costing of what it costs to get someone who's gone off and done it on their own. How do you get that across a whole system? And then the final thing um, is, so you have your creative resolution, but then action. And for that, you need cracking middle leadership. And the offering around middle leadership at the moment is pretty lowbrow, I would say. I think you could do better in this country. There are brilliant off-the-shelf programs on middle leadership and how to um, take ideas and make them happen on the ground, run by the Scottish Government. Not for education, just run for anyone in Scottish Government who wants to run project, projects and say, you know, a more agile way, more prototyping kind of way. More of that for the education workforce is not a bad thing. Um, so yeah, that's the way I would do it. And it, it's not an event, it's kind of continual improvement, but it's super transparent. And people can see where things are going and they can have a view on whether it should or not. But also there's no nasty surprises for the policymakers that way. Because you're showing your cards the whole time. You're saying we're thinking about trying this. 
let's go for it. But is there a daring politician who would go for that approach because you don't get any big announcements? Yeah, and, and I think that's been, that's been really helpful because um, what you're seeing is that what we need is discussion to be built in as an iterative process. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's tended to happen all the time, and again, people can come in on this as well in Scottish education, is that we come up with a proposal, it goes to consultation, it then goes back into the centre and something comes back out at the end of it which actually is a decent combination of the responses to consultation plus the original idea, mm. but nobody recognises it. Um, you know, so going back years, we had the Howie report, we had consultation in the Howie report, then we got higher still, nobody recognised it. And there are so many things, I think, like that, that have gone through the system because we don't have that iterative process. And the other thing, just very briefly, I think, to point to make around that, is that what you're arguing, I think, very strongly and, and, and touching on more generally is that we have so many things to build on. Mm. So we've had the courage to enter into a national conversation. We've opened up that debate. We've raised expectations. That's a huge risk. We, we, I'm listening to you, and one of the things that keeps coming back to me is schools of ambition. Mm -hmm. which was a different model for development in Scotland where we gave schools the opportunity to do something that was appropriate in their context. We got all that work done and never scaled any of it up. We then moved on to holistic change through curriculum for excellence rather than organic change through the schools of ambition model. But we have that and we've got so many bits and pieces around. And one of the phrases I used earlier was that what we're masters of and mistresses of in this country is missing the opportunities that we've created for ourselves. So, mm. final comments on that. I think um, two things come to mind. And one of them is, um, I'm very wary of showing this. I need to double check it's the right one. Yeah. So when we, we look at schools, these are not all schools we work with, um, but they're interesting schools that we spot and we look at. They're, they're part of our work when we benchmark. We often get asked to benchmark. You know, how are we compared to the Joneses? So these are some of the best schools in the world. And when you look at those schools, they're all great for different reasons, but they all do certain things well. There's like a big core of, of stuff that you just do well. So whether it's, um, they're not all private schools either. I think that's really important for me to say. Some of these are state schools. Some of them are charter schools in America. Some of them are independent. You'll recognize some of them. Some of them are um, uh, relatively, you might think, I've never heard of it before. Of all these schools, only a handful, two or three, have been created in the past decade, all created by people who work in the communications industry, people who know how to listen. And the other thing is they've all got a distinctive thing. Remember, these are individual schools operating within a system, but they've chosen the thing that they're going for. That's their ambition. So when you talk about ambitious schools, ambitious for what? What's your thing going to be? And the focus allows them to really go headlong into it and, and, make, and make a difference. But when you take a look at where they sit in this, so are they um, leveraging their current capabilities or are they developing brand new capabilities? That's an important question for us in Scotland. Are we talking about, have we got, you know, have we got the right people on the bus? Are, are, are teachers doing a good job? And are we talking about transforming the way teachers teach? Well, the answer is no. Because when you look at the most successful schools, most of them actually just make tiny, tiny incremental changes to the way they actually teach. It's not transformation, it's not reform. It's, it's tweaking, it's getting better every day. And the ones who develop brand new capabilities, they're all the new ones in the, in the last decade or so. And so you've got avenues right there in the top right, which develop new capabilities. And here's why, because uh, they developed their own curriculum from scratch. They didn't have to do this. They could have taken the International Baccalaureate or Cambridge or anything. They could have taken hires and nat fives if they wanted to. What I, I don't understand in Scotland is why we don't have more schools saying, you know what? We're not going to go with the SQA qualification. We're going to create our own. They created this from scratch themselves. It's a, like a periodic table of the things that they value in their work. There's a great explanatory video, so I'll tweet this when I stop. I can't do two things at once, so when I stop speaking, 
so that you can watch the wee video clip, four minutes and understand it, and then have an explore. They stitch this together on a personalized curriculum for every kid. So the, the students design their own learning. And this is all the way pre-kindergarten, all the way through to the end of high school. They develop this, and then they've gone to the universities to get it recognized. And the universities love it. If you're a graduate from any avenue school, you will be guaranteed an interview at a top university place. And they, have, they are entrepreneurial young people. They care about the planet. They're the, they're the same as our kids in many ways. But their curriculum is just right for them. And it gives, in this case, parents a choice. Imagine um, if, if we did that here, what would it look like? Now, the fact is, I don't think our system allows it. I don't think our system is set up to allow a school to be as entrepreneurial to create its own curriculum. But the idea that you're beholden to whatever the SQA provides for me, feels quite distinctive because there are very few countries in the world where that's the case. And, and we're at a stage where we've, we've been asked to review and reform SQA um, and asked to look again at Education Scotland mm. and the relationship between inspection and development. So again, just returning to the point that the opportunities I think are there on the table and the difficulty is that we've postponed making decisions mm. because we're now waiting for Hayward, we're waiting for the national conversation to be summarised, we're waiting for everything to come back. And it'll all come at us in a rush. And I suspect that we'll actually be overwhelmed by it. We'll you, won't have have, you won't have time to do anything about it, don't worry. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the process won't be iterative. Mm. So I think this conversation has been helpful in terms of forewarning us about how that model works. I wanted to be hopeful, though, in the fact that I think there's more agency in what schools and teachers can do for themselves than maybe we believe there is. There's no reason why a, a Scottish school doesn't decide to pick up the international baccalaureate instead of this. For its middle school, why it doesn't take on an MYP, middle years program, for example. Or it doesn't create its own avenues like curriculum, or even borrow it. One, our school in Kyiv in Ukraine, when it got shut down 11 months ago, ended up having to move, first of all, all over the world, and then it, now it's sitting on the football pitches of the American School of Warsaw, another one of our schools. They, they've put some buildings there, so they're not out in the snow. Um, they didn't have a way to teach children who were both in situ and all around the world, but they wanted to keep together as a school. Avenues gave them their curriculum. Do you know how? Because it's online. It can be taught online as well as in person. So you, the, it'd be interesting to see a, an era where maybe there's more entrepreneurialism um, afforded with the budget to support it that allows teachers to be curriculum makers with frameworks, sure. With guidance, yes. With expertise to help them, definitely. But that's, that would be uh, revolutionary, but it would be something that could take place in small steps. But you've... Um You've come up with what I think is a startling concept, which is revolution and evolution combined. Mm -hmm. Because the model that you talked about was very much the model that I describe as success comes from adaptation, not adoption. Yeah. And that whole idea of allowing people to make incremental progress within a framework that offers the opportunity for more but you don't need to take advantage of that. So it's, it's an interesting concept of simply getting people to recognize the opportunities are there. And that, as, as we said earlier, was the original model for Curriculum for Excellence. Let's offer a framework where our purpose is clear, there are some principled documents around building the curriculum, get ahead and do it. And people were just too anxious that they would get it wrong. Um, and I think it's just important before I throw open for formal questions to, to stress the fact, Ewan, that you, you have worked with Scottish schools, Calder Glen High School, you mentioned, yeah. which to some extent have followed this model. Yeah, and, and also uh, plenty of others who we've interviewed, developed case studies of. So there's, I think there's fantastic practice going on, but it's um, hiding under its bushel. Good to know. Anyone want to come in? Just a formal, before we, we round off, a formal opportunity. Yeah. Good 
I know. <laughs> <laughs> you say. Um, a really interesting, really loads to think about. Um, I keep coming back to the idea of what are the barriers I have. I'm a secondary school teacher in uh, Broughton, so North Edinburgh. Mm. And um, like these things are all great. And the staff that I know and the pupils I know, that'd be the way they'd want to go. I feel there would need to be a cultural change, not just within the school, but how do you get the community involved? Because yeah. parents are still sitting there going, right, so what national fives are they going to get? And I'm like, it's not about, it's not about that. But that's what they want. So if we were to try and do something different, I think it's unlikely that it's going to happen anytime soon, sadly. But how do you get, if you're starting a new school, I get that it's different, but how do you get it if it's in a school that already exists? How do you yeah. change the culture of the community to, to, to change the idea that exams aren't the be all and end all? So, yeah, it's, it's starting with a new school, you'd, you'd think it's easier because it's a blank sheet of paper, but you have the confusion of, often of the founder, uh, the person paying for it, who isn't necessarily an educationalist. And you have to kind of, that's your parent of one, and they're very loud, and you have to listen to them because they're paying you to create this school. So it's slightly, it's the same but different. Um, you've got to listen to your community. And so what we sometimes see, the school that we're working with in New York at the moment, for example, has been sitting on a decision for a few years now, and, and understandably so, maybe not the best time to introduce a big new idea, like a new curriculum. Um, the school board, so a governing council or school board, and the leadership team really needed quality time to sit together and think through all this, everything that's at stake, and almost kind of go through the decision-making process themselves first without coming to a decision whether it's right. And then they've got to mimic that same process that our team lead with them, they've got to go and do that with their community. So for example, we're sending them two emails a week, emails pretty direct, but two emails a week, really well written provocations about curriculum, about decision making, how they're going to do this, just to get them thinking. And then they've got a board meeting in 10 days where they're going to thrash it out in their own heads. And kind of, I think you need that time to work it out for yourself. What you don't want to be doing is working it out yourself while trying to convince parents that it's a good idea. And I used to do that, and you just fall flat on your face every time. So better to work it through, do a pre-mortem, work out how is this idea going to die, who's going to kill it. You write down what we call an objection list, which is all the objections people are going to give. Have fun doing that. Get a bottle, get some colleagues, have fun on the whiteboard. Where all the ways we're going to get ripped to shreds for this. And then for every one of them, the next day with some black coffee, you go through logically, what can we do to mitigate it? And often what the parents say is, there's a valid point in it. So someone's saying, but I want my child to have, you know, 10 nat fives and five, um, they're gonna get five A's at higher, and then they're gonna do advanced hires, and then they're gonna go and, you know, and I had a doctor the other day tell me his daughter had done all the heavy subjects, and I had to ask him what he meant. Of course, it was just sciences and math. I thought, wow, you're, a, Thank God, they don't come to dinner parties. It would be, it'd be a challenging conversation in our household full of musicians. So the, going through that, you say, right, well, they want a reassurance that whatever we do is going to be accepted at universities that our kids tend to go to. Those parents, go and speak with universities. So go to the admissions people at Glasgow, uh, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and say, this is what we're thinking of doing. What would it take? And they might tell you what you need, the missing bit in your project, actually. And then the next thing I would think is, what about the, the kids whose parents aspire for that, but who are not, it's not right for them. So it's not the best fit for them to go for, you know, they, we don't want them to not do well, but it's not to go to university. They'd be better going into an apprenticeship or something like that. So work through the scenario for them. Well, we need to guarantee a sort of academic success so they can do their apprenticeship, but they can, if they want to, go to university too. What's that journey going to look like? And it's just cold light of day stuff, going through it logically. And we do that for people quite often because it takes time. Um, but I think it's a really important exercise. And you could do it over like four months. You actually take a long time to, to do it. And each time you come up with that mitigating, or oh, we would need to think about, go and do it. Make the phone calls and see what people are doing. And then you might come up with a, an interesting kind of curricular alternative that you can start to pilot in an opt-in basis with the first 20 kids who want to give it a go. Or, you know, you have a little cohort and have a school within a school. 
And that might work. You kind of do it already in Britain in some ways when you think of your attitude in sports. So why not do it in other ways too? And interestingly, why don't we work more with community learning and development? People who are good at community engagement and yet we take these tasks on ourselves as if these other services yeah, didn't exist. And the number of people that will pay for a motivational speaker but would never pay for somebody to conduct that kind of exercise who's got expertise in it. I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. The people that get rolled out to do CPD, um, it's it, absolutely fascinating. That we could pay people to do work for us in areas that we find difficult, and that's one of them. But Bruce? I was just going, just thinking about, uh, you wanted to change the curriculum, you know, change your ethos and things. But I work in the primary, and we still get questions from parents. Where are they? Are they going to get it to the high school? And how? Because they're all driving for that yeah. thing. Already, they're thinking of that. So if the high schools change that, which is great, I think it's a great idea, because it, it, I'm the person who does the running club and stuff like that. Yeah. Because once I, once I leave, no one else will I do it. I used to be. Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but you know, because I'm a feeder school for Barmere, and so if they, if they wanted to do something different, then that would have to then not necessarily, because... But it might be nice for us to have that, because that would be a helpful guide for us. Yeah, I think it, if you're... Um, you could try, if you're in a position where you are, are pretty much guaranteed that a high majority of your students will go on into the same school, it's definitely worthwhile considering it in what we would call a K-12 way. So you kind of look at a continuum of curriculum the whole way up. Um, you could look at... Um, in particular, skills would be an easy place to start, I think. Meta skills, you know, the, the stuff that's been done by Skills Development Scotland is exceptional and, um, and they are for the taking. So if you were to do a curriculum map of, of skill building in, in primary school, you'd get so far. Imagine sitting together and saying, right, we think we can, by P7, they're going to be absolutely hitting this and what's the, they're going to be hungry to do more and then suddenly in S1, the experience becomes much clearer. Oh, we could offer you know, entrepreneurial stuff like that, right? We could maybe bridge it in S1 with a project based around these things. And you, know, you could do any number of IDL projects, but maybe there's a stimulus. But there's another um, 12 or however many primary schools who aren't doing that. And so you have to, whatever you're doing, you're looking at how it can be inclusive. So what's the, what's the way to fast forward kids who show up? halfway through, who, don't, who, who weren't there at the beginning of your progression. Um, so that's maybe pick one area like skills development and go for that first, which is not maybe mission critical in the same way as touching you know, the, the big, what was it the doctor called them, the heavy subjects. Yeah. Um, but it allows you to fail safely and then you can tweak and then you can go and look at those kind of more core areas maybe. I don't know if that answered your question, but... <laughs> So, yeah. so the other th well, that, thing, if, 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 if I may, yeah. the other thing that, the other thing that came to mind, because you were saying also that, you know, there's that parental expectation early on, and that was the bit I hadn't answered. I think you have to also, it, it, after you've done your listening, you have to put a stick in the sand and say, well, this is where we are today. So one of my first projects, it was Rosendale Primary School in Brixton in London. And the two heads at the school, the deputy and, and head, came up with a wee book, How We Learn What We Learn. And they put it as a PDF, but they printed it and gave it to parents. And every time the parents arrive, they do it. And it's, they don't shy away from educational philosophy, and this is what we stand for, and then theory into practice. Here's how we put it into practice in our school. And they walk parents through this on information evenings on newsletters they reiterate the language that might be overkill or it might be actually just what you need to do and kind of say that our school this is how we do it having a wee bit of institutional confidence that you're right and see parents who have that kind of concern I think the concern is legit they want their kid to do well and they don't know what they don't know so show them this other side that's important you know is that as American School of Warsaw would put it, there's more, you put the same into life as you put into school. 
We've got to make sure that we have kids who aren't just really good at maths and English, but who also know how to live. We, we, we banned two words. I did a bit of work in Wakefield. We banned two words. One was feeder. Um, that, that we wouldn't talk about feeder schools. And the other word we banned was transition because people obsess around transition, whereas what they need to obsess with is progression. Mm. And the idea that we're not on a continuum, but there's somehow a transition and moving across, just destroys the whole concept of continuity in education. It makes it much more difficult for other partners to engage with us. So, a lot, lot to be done and said around that. Linda, did you want to come in? Thanks. I thought so much of what you said was really interesting, and I loved that you talked so passionately and positively about extracurricular. I manage the Wide Achievement and Lifelong Learning Service in Edinburgh, so I was delighted to hear I'm you I'm only sorry about. that you saw the back of my head for the whole time. <laughs> but I suppose, and you also mentioned talking to CLD, and you brought that up yourself, David, a few minutes ago. I do think that we have those conversations and that in a room we recognise and talk about the value of those things. You're right, they are the low-hanging fruit every single time there's budget cuts, and that's what we're facing right now. Yeah. How do we get over that? Well, I mean, I think one of the things is, one of the joys that I have in the job I do is I manage a team of many different professionals and we don't get groupthink. And I often think that what happens is we talk about these things and then teachers with a teaching background come together and often we don't invite the other voices in. And I would argue it's not a national conversation. It is a national teacher's conversation, but not enough of the other voices I think have been part of that. So I just putting that out there, one of the things we talk about very much in lifelong learning wider achievement is no poverty of opportunity, parity of esteem, and find your passion. Because when young people find your passion, they're not going to find their passion if we don't have lifelong learning, if we don't have wider achievement. So there's my little bit of soapbox because I love what you were saying and I think you're completely right and we've just got to do it. To be fair, we all know it's Linda's soapbox. She provides the drive and the funding. So, you know, do what you like with it, Linda. That's fine. You, wonder, do you want to come back I in? I was just going to say, it relates to what you were saying too, but it's literally, how do you go about um, making it right? Because it's not right. But I think that there's this impression that things, that, that we're waiting for these reports to come around, for example. We're waiting to see what people are going to tell us. And it, that's not how it works. It doesn't have to work like that. You can just go off and do stuff and break things. And I was thinking our, our approach, so I'm going to, I have to write it down even though I wrote it um, with my team. So think about w one of the challenges, there's this, the school purpose, there's also your own individual purpose and what you're in it for and what you want out of it. And if you're, it, when it's a purpose, it means you don't really care if people get in the way of it because you will keep going and doing it. So ours is that every learner should be able to experience confidence, creativity, and endless curiosity. That's, that's all we care about. And the, the every is important. Um, and the way that we do that is we help school leaders think and do things differently. But then more interesting maybe is our, our values, like the, and it's also the way we speak, hopefully. It comes over in our email, provocation email every Monday, and it comes over in it, maybe this evening. Um, and I wonder if this is how you could maybe work as well when you want to have your voice heard in these processes or you don't like what comes out and it feels irrelevant in your context. So confident but approachable. So confidence is kind of knowing that you've got a process you can rely on. So even if you have a bad day, you wake up the next day, you still go back to that same process, you know it works. And ours is based on uh, human intelligence, not research and um, not what the books tell us. We go and see people. So human intelligence trumps anything, I think, that we can find in the books because the humans understand their context best and listen, really listening in order to create things together. And the second one was, um, is provocative yet supportive. Um, our provocation, some, our sense of provocation, people are nervous about it. It's one of the reasons we don't work in Scotland a lot is because I think people are nervous about being provoked. Um, but we're supportive with it. So yes, we will push a system and say, why on earth would you do it that way when people do it this way or elsewhere in the world? And we try to show that people do things in different ways elsewhere. And, and we ask generally, why not? Why not have a try? And it's always, you're all, you never come across great when you respond to a why not with a because. You come over as a stick in the mud. 
So why not, is are two brilliant words as a question to ask to get people thinking creatively. Like, why not make your own curriculum? Because I don't know if universities would value it. Well, let's go and speak to universities. Done. Uh, why not create a K-12 curriculum with your, with, with your local high school? Oh, because we've not got time to collaborate on it. Right, let's go and see if we can get some money to free up time and some people, extra people on deck. Or could we start school an hour later one day a week? like the banks do when they used to have branches to teach people. Um, inspiring but pragmatic. There's more to life than reports. We always get asked to write bloody reports. And they publish these two, so interdisciplinary learning and learner pathways. They published these before we'd even had a chance to lay them out and make them look pretty. Um, so I, I want to do that, but they're, they're full of things that you can do, next steps that you could take to think through some of these challenges. Um, so it's, I don't know if they're inspiring, but they're certainly pragmatic. And then creative and fun. Um, if you can bring in experiences from outside school, so bring, speaking with people who worked in youth work and community learning and development were the highlights of all those interviews that we did because it was just so different. And they were highlighting some of the things that were real headaches for head teachers in schools because they were getting squeezed, they were finding it hard to support and sustain. And, and yet they, it was like they didn't have a phone book and they couldn't phone up each other. And it's not just the teachers to, I think, get in touch with community learning and development, but maybe also for that strategy around like community learning and development is not an endless time. You know, there's, there's, there's a limited number of people in time to do it. So where would you place your bets to get the biggest bang back for that? And I think advertising that, making that clearer to people would then make it easier to collaborate. I think there's probably a little bit of, we don't want to ask for, too much because we know that everyone's stretched and that goes both ways. So it's much better just to be clear, you know, what do you want to develop? And then be loud about it and people will come out the woodwork to, to help you do that. I mean, I, I'm not finished, um, but we need to end the session. Um, so many more things that I wanted to pick up. I think what Ewan's done for me particularly brilliantly tonight is to say we can take action and we must take the action we can take. So let's be clear about that. And let's stop postponing, let's stop waiting, let's make the changes that we can make. And let's use the framework that's there in terms of the knowledge and the experience that we've got and taken through that lens of human intelligence as you describe it. Common sense would be another way of looking at that, that the potential's there to do that. I've certainly found this enormously stimulating and it just reinforces my sense that we do not make the most of the resources and potential that we have. There'll be lots of people who will be becoming aware of no tosh for the first time and yet it's a massive Scottish success story. Um, and it offers the opportunity to bring in an international perspective. And I'm grateful that you've done that for us tonight and put it in the context pragmatically of what we can also do here. So thank you so much to Ewan for that. We'll have the opportunity for more informal conversation in a minute. Could I just remind people or inform you that our next creative conversation will be on the 2nd of March and it's Howell Roberts, who's got a book out called Botheredness. Um, I've had the benefit of reviewing it, and it's fabulous. It's exciting, entertaining, amusing. It's full of practical advice. Howell, for anybody who's heard him before, it, it's like Peter Kay um, having gone to university and done an education degree. I mean, he is that funny, he is that good, but the content is there, the research is there. So again, please, and we've got a, what do you call that thing? A QR code. <laughs> Thank you very much. QR code. Uh, they just let me out of the home today. Um, we've got a QR code that you can use to sign up for it. And then we're going to have Anne Bamford back at some point. We haven't got a date for that yet. Um, but she's made brilliant contributions to creative education across Scotland. And she's agreed that she'll come back. We just need to fix a date for that. So keep your eye open for that. And we're planning a brilliant conversation around inspirational teaching and what kind of teachers actually change young people's lives. Um, we've got Val McDermott tentatively signed up for that, and we're exploring the possibility of getting Graeme Armstrong, the author of The Young Team, 
um, to come along and be part of that discussion as well. So lots coming up. Please keep your eye out for it. But thanks not only for coming tonight, thanks for staying. This is the, this is the most seated audience we've ever had for any of these. Usually folk have started filtering away around about half five. Maybe you felt too embarrassed to do it. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for staying. And please, a huge thanks to you and Macintosh. <laughs>